सो आई नो ईच ऑफ यू गाइज इज कैरिंग अ मोबाइल फोन और उस पर एक बहुत प्यारी सी एप्लीकेशन है कॉल्ड यूट्यूब हैव यू हर्ड ऑफ इट कैन यू प्लीज ओपन अप यूट्यूब और वहां पर अगर आप सर्च करेंगे एल एम ए लुधियाना यू विल बी एबल टू फाइंड दिस ब्यूटिफुल लुकिंग पेज विच हैज वन हंड्रेड एंड थर्टी एट सब्सक्राइबर्स एंड आई एम ट्रैकिंग यू गाइज लाइव राइट नाउ वाइल वी इंक्रीज आर सब्सक्राइबर्स कैन वी प्लीज स्टार्ट डूइंग दैट आई सी अंड्रेड पीपल एट लीस्ट इन द हॉल राइट नाउ बिफोर इट गेट फिल्स अप लेस जिस गेट इट डन so i'm refreshing it 146 no bad 149 guys you're very slow you have to be a little faster youtube the beautiful looking application on your own mobile phone lma ludhiana let's raise this number as well because the live video for this beautiful session is going to be streamed right there and if you subscribe so can your people see wonderful and this number increases 154 good evening satri kal namaskar and welcome to this flagship event of ludhiana management association on behalf of the president ms harpit kang i raghav chaudhary stand before you as general secretary and congratulate you for being an active member of this legacy organization today as we get together in this 46th year of our establishment i wonder how splendid and powerful the founders of lma would feel looking at this tenured evening may i kindly request our distinguished speaker for the day mr sanjeev mehta to grace the stage with your presence and join our team on the stage please can we have a round of applause thanks sir thank you mr mehta may i kindly request our respected mr sachit jain managing director wardman to kindly present a bouquet of flowers as a token of honor to our distinguished guest for the evening this will be for them this one Thank you Mr Jain. Today we have amongst us a distinguished guest and we have all gathered here to listen and learn from his story. And what better way to start this wonderful evening than with this traditional lamp lighting ceremony. As I invite our distinguished speaker for the evening along with our eminent past presidents for the lamp lighting, I hope and pray that the light of this lamp today spreads positivity and great enthusiasm in this entire hall so mr anil kumar mr sachit jain dr sandeep kapoor mr neeraj jain may i kindly request शुभम कुरुत्व 
Thank you for this ceremonial start. We have on this beautiful evening a lot of new guests joining us. I welcome all of them. Allow me to introduce Ludhiana Management Association. Founded in 1978, Ludhiana Management Association emerged as an affiliated unit of the esteemed IMA New Delhi, propelled by the vision of management lumen industrialists. The overarching aims of LMA encompass bolstering the proficiency of member organizations through robust management education, offering comprehensive training and development programs for entrepreneurs and executives across all echelons, fostering dialogues with eminent industrialists and CEOs. Over time, LMA has evolved into a preeminent and rapidly burgeoning management association in northern India boasting a membership roster of 650 distinguished industrialists, entrepreneurs, top-tier management executives, esteemed management academicians, bankers, and seasoned professionals. Noteworthy accolades adorn LMA's illustrious journey, including the prestigious Best LMA Award for the years 2010 and 2014 on a national scale, bestowed by IMA New Delhi. Steered by a constellation of as eminent industrialist, LMA's leadership legacy shines brightly. Past presidents such as Sri Brij Mohanlal Munjal, chairman of Hero Motor Corp Limited, and Mr. S. P. Oswal, chairman of Vardhman Group, have been honored with, with the Padma Bhushan, while Mr. Rajinder Gupta of Trident Group has been awarded the Padam Shri. Additionally, Mr. Sunil Khan Munjal, chairman of Hero Corporate Services, has also served as the past president of CII. The roll call of distinguished keynote speakers at LMA event reads like a who's who of India's intellectual and corporate landscape, including luminaries such as His Excellency Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, former President of India, Dr. Manmohan Singh, former fi Finance Minister and Prime Minister of India, and Mr. Anand Mahindra, Vice Chairman of Man Mahindra and Mahindra Limited, amongst many others. For the past 28 years, the Honorable Governor of Punjab has graciously presided as the chief guest at LMA's annual function, underscoring the enduring significance and influence of this association in the region. In the current tenure, under the leadership of Harpit Kang as the current president, Team LMA is committed to creating more value for its esteemed members. Once again, a very warm welcome to each of you on this lovely evening. Such a privilege for me to be standing in here and having the opportunity to host this evening amongst all of you guys, members of Ludhiana LMA, distinguished guest, ladies and gentlemen. I am honored to read an introduction of a worthy speaker for this evening. Mr. Sanjeev Mehta is an Indian business executive and the former chairman and managing director of Hindustan Unilever Limited, India's largest FMCG company and one of the top five most valuable companies in India. Mr. Mehta became the CEO and MD of Hindustan Unilever in October 2013 and in June 2018 was appointed chairman. He also heads Unilever's business in South Asia as the cluster president encompassing businesses in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka and Nepal. Mr. Sanjeev Mehta is a member of the Unilever Leadership Executive, its Global Executive Board. Born in Kanpur, Mr. Sanjeev Mehta studied in Mumbai and Nagpur. He's a chartered accountant from ICI and later completed the Advanced Management Program from the Harvard Business HUL's Mom and the Best CEO Medium Company category, Business Today, amongst many others. Mr. Sanjeev Mehta is also ex-president of FIKI and currently also serving as non-executive independent board member of Air India Limited, member of South Asia Advisory Board of the Harvard Business School, and a current director of Board of India Indian School of Business. He's married to Mona Mehta, who too is a chartered accountant, and they have twin daughters, Nana and Roshni, who studied at Cornell, MIT, and Harvard University, respectively. 
Ladies and gentlemen, let us have a resounding welcome to the city of Ludhiana for Mr. Sanjeev Mehta. Can I have the clicker? I think that would be better. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Hi, good evening, namaste, and satsri akal. Absolutely delighted to be here today. Uh, I'm a very proud Punjabi. But this is the first occasion, while I've traveled a lot in Punjab, this is my first visit to Ludhiana. So I'm absolutely delighted to be here. And uh, I think my coming here should be attributed to one individual, Harpreet. She's been so insistent in ensuring that I do come here. And I'm absolutely delighted that it might be a bit late, but uh, I'm so glad to be here. So what I'm going to do today is share with you a story, a story of India and a story of Hindustan Unilever. Now, HUL, which is uh, India's largest FMCG company, this is going to be India's decade and beyond. And we'll leave sufficient time for you to ask any questions that you may have. But if you choose to, you can even stop me while I'm present. Now, if we look around us, it's very clear that capitalism has prevailed over socialism. Capitalism, perhaps, is the best way to allocate scarce resources, or perhaps the least worst way of capitalism. Otherwise, we would have social chaos in the country. Yeah? Now, a fact which many of you may not know is that when India gained independence, we were bereft of resources. There was nothing with us. The GDP of the country then, at today's prices, was less than the market cap of Hindustan Unilever. So we had virtually nothing. And uh, many of you might remember 91. Some of the youngsters here may not remember 91. But this is when our psyche was marred. Yeah. When India had to cart gold from the walls of Reserve Bank in Nagpur, take it to Bank of England, take it to Switzerland to get a meager loan of $2 billion. We did not even have credit worthiness to get loan without a collateral. And the reason was we had no resources. We were completely bankrupt. In fact, if you go back to the 60s, the decade when I was born, there was something infamously called as PL 480. Public Loan 480. India, with successive droughts, had no option but to plead to US to give us grains, because we did not even have food to feed our people. And that came under Eisenhower had a scheme called Public Loan 480. Under that, grains were given to India. But we were literally moving around with a begging bowl. And 91 is not very long back, guys. If you look at from 47 to 90s, our country grew at the famous Hindu rate of growth of about 3.5%, out of which about 1.5%, 2% used to go in population growth, which meant India's per capita GDP used to grow with a meager 1.5%. Now, during the period 2000 to 2013, of course, HUL was never in the same predicament as the country was in 91, but we went through a bad patch. And during this period, 
both the FMCG index as well as the BSC index far outstripped us. This was a period post-liberalization when new players came in, many more multinationals came in, and they were chipping away at our market share. So what I'm going to tell you the story is about India and HUL now. If you look at our country today, we are very close to becoming a $4 trillion economy. But more importantly than the absolute number is the fact that for the last three decades, our CAGR, our compounded annual rate of growth has been in the vicinity of 6.5%. From a country which had no resources, bereft of resources, from a country which was moving around with a begging bowl, here we are, the fifth largest economy, and poised to become the third largest economy in the next few years. But very importantly, when we were growing up, we had a very famous economist called Mahal Nobis, whose doctrine was that our large population is an albatross around our neck. We can't grow because of our population. Look today. Today, when you talk about India, you talk about 1.45 billion consumers. You talk about the market attractiveness. That's the big shift that has happened in India. And last year, we grew at 7 plus percent, 7.2 percent. This year, if you look at Moody's estimate, it's 6.8 percent. If you look at RBI's estimate, it is 7.3 percent. Forget the decimals. We are talking about India being the largest or the fastest growing major economy. That's a big shift which has happened in our lifetime. And just think of it. In another few years, we'll pride ourselves in the fact that we have become the third largest economy. That's a big shift that has happened. I can tell you I've been traveling extensively over the last many decades. And I have seen how the blue passport is now respected by the immigration officials. Yeah, there was a time when most of the people who used to travel from India were workers going to the Middle East. Now it's very different. I remember uh, two years back when I was in Boston and gone to meet our daughters. I was in an Uber, and the driver asked me, so where are you from? I said, what do I look like? He said, you look like from South Asia. I said, you're right, I'm an Indian. So his immediate response was IT. I had to tell him there are some people in India who make their living also selling soaps and soups. <laughs> yeah, but the important bit is, how IT has changed the image of India. Completely different. It's not just that we go there to do manual work, but today Indian managers are respected, Indian managers lead one of the biggest corporations, Indian deans are across the world, and that's made a big difference. Now, this is the story of HUL over the last 10 years. We increased our market cap from 12 billion to 76 billion. And today, HUL is more valued than some of the big global consumer good multinationals. It is more valued than Colgate globally, more valued than Kraft Heinz, more valued than Kellogg's, Record Bankiza. Yeah, so it's this story that I'm going to talk about of transform and outperform. Now, I've been fortunate to lead Unilever's businesses for the last 22 years, and I have led Unilever's businesses in about 30 countries in Asia, in Middle East, and North Africa. Now, over the years, I have codified what it takes to make a great company, a high-performing business. And what I'm going to do is use that example to interweave and say what it takes 
to make an high-performing country. In many ways, very similar, but the nuances are very different. So the troika of high performance, you know, McKinsey guys love their two by two metrics. I love my troikas. So I'm going to talk to you about the three axes, the mindset, the capabilities which have to be distinctive and hard to replicate, and the high performance in autonomy. These three are vital if you have to make your business a truly high performing business. Let's start with mindset. It is always mind over matter, guys. I always tell my team, you first win the battle of mind before you win in the market. And mind makes a tremendous difference. Today, the important bit about our country is the self-belief. Our country has started believing that we can win. Our country has started believing that we can become a great nation again. Yeah? And some of the things which stand out for us, first are demographics. If you look around Europe, it is like an open-air museum today. And I believe the best of Europe is behind them. If you look at Japan, it's like a home for the aged. In our country, with the kind of median age we have, we understand the demographics is a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition. It's important for growth, but not a sufficient condition. Now, I was talking about Winston Churchill and compassionate capitalism. If we really look at it, over the last 20 odd years, India has lifted on an average 1% of the population every year from out of the poverty trap into lower middle class. That's a very substantive shift. If you were to look at UN's SDGs, they will achieve the SDGs only because India will achieve. Without India achieving, UN has no chance of achieving the SDGs. The startup ecosystem is the third largest, over 100,000. There was a period when we were having a unicorn every week. Yeah, but forget the valuations. I think today, at Hindustan Unilever, when we were going around to recruit the best possible talent in the country as the employer of choice, our biggest competitors were not the guys from Goldman Sachs or McKinsey. It is people who want to become entrepreneurs. But that's good for the country. Our country needs good managers, but solidly and steadily, series of reforms have taken place. Some of the big ones have been GST, rationalization of corporate taxes, IBC. You know, many times we talk about the private capex is not coming in. But we must remember that thanks to insolvency and bankruptcy code, assets worth 8 lakh crores have been released into productive use, which would otherwise have been stuck. That's made a material difference. So series of reforms which are taking place, much more has to be done, but we are in the right direction. Coming to HUL, first is in a country like India, you need to have a portfolio. If you want to become a category leader, you cannot operate in niches. You have to straddle the price benefit pyramid. The other important bit is, it's not just about gaining market shares. In a country like India, you have to increase the size of the pie, or you have to make the market of what we call as market development. The other thing with India's progress, a secular trend is premiumization. And last but not the least, how do you bring in cost efficiency which will enable you to compete with the best in the world? To compete with the best in the world, we will have to compete on cost, quality, service, and innovation. Without that, we will never become the best businesses in the world. Now, this is an example I'm giving you of straddling the price-benefit pyramid. Look at hair category. 
At the bottom of pyramid, we have a family health brand called Clinic Plus. Then we occupy all the benefit spaces, mass beauty, damage hair, salon kind of hair at home, anti-dandruff, and a high voltage Ayurvedic brand. Then when you look at price point, one of the largest selling SKUs is one rupee sachet of Clinic Plus. You know, when I tell the Brits we sell a product for one hundredth of a UK pound, they don't believe it. London may aapko one hundredth of a UK pound may hawabi nahi milegi. And for us, this is not a CSR, guys. We make decent margins on it. Just think of it. Ek rupay mein we give squeaky clean hair to millions of consumers. It sounds like a miracle at times, but that's a reality. That's the kind of supply chain efficiency we have. The other is the tea, very similar. We occupy all the benefits and price points. In 2017, we took over leadership of the tea category from my good friend, Tata Tea. And since then, we have been widening the gap. So the first lesson is, if you want to be a category leader, don't operate in niches, straddle the price benefit pyramid. Yeah. Second is market development. India is a country where we will have to create segments of the future. Out of the 60,000 crores of HUL's turnover, 10,000 crore are in segments which did not exist 10 years back. We built it and built it very assiduously. You know, having a good advert, flighting in on air, I call it lazy marketing. Going home to home, educating consumers, building your category is called grind marketing. But that's how you build new categories of the future. Every year, HUL's people, they go to 100 million households. Just think of it. 100 million households every year sampling a product, educating our consumers, and making them experience our brands. The shift with that is, when we create new categories, we're also getting premium consumers into the fold. So our portfolio is shifting more towards premium. Here I'm not talking about prestige. I'm not talking even of mass stage. I'm not talking about the LVMH kind of categories. I'm talking about relative premium to the average of the market. The other, look at this surf Excel model. It's a classic model. If you move from surf Excel detergent bar to the pods, your cost or the sales realization moves up by a factor of seven. That's what premiumization allows you to do. That's how you start changing the game. Now, a good FMCG company globally generates a saving of about 3 to 4% of our turnover every year. Now, if you bring in owner's mindset, if you drive efficiency and productivity to a new level, you could generate savings which you have not seen before. So just think of it on a 60,000 crore turnover, turnover when, when you, you generate, generate savings of 6 to 7% of, of your turnover. turnover. You are talking about a massive sum of money which you redeploy for your product upgradation, market development, and fighting your competitive battles. Today, the cost of Unilever's HUL is the lowest amongst all Unilever companies in the world, even lower than Unilever in China. And that's why it allows us to operate in segments like one rupee. Otherwise, it would not have been possible. So it's massive efficiency and productivity driven by data and technology. Now, let me come to distinctive capabilities. Every business has to identify a handful of capabilities where they are best in class. Not as good as, but best in class. Maybe the next gen. And if they are easy to replicate, then they will not give you a competitive edge. But if they are difficult to replicate, that creates a moat around you 
which allows you to create the competitive edge. Now, when we look at India, I'll share a few examples. I think India stack is a game changer. You know, there were times when we were growing up, all the innovations and technology and capabilities were coming from west to the east. Now, if you look at UPI, there are many developed countries who have approached India, can we borrow your technology? That's been a game changer. The first industrial revolution, the steam engine. The second industrial revolution, the internal combustion engine bypassed us because we were a colony. The third industrial revolution, internet, we were a very small economy. The fourth industrial revolution plays to our strength. This is going to be another big game changer for us. Now, physical infrastructure. If you look at US's development, it took place after the Great Recession between the First World War and the Second World War. In India, if you go through the Gati Shakti portal, you will find over a period of five years, India is investing $1.2 trillion in physical infrastructure. 40 kilometers of roads are being built every day. Our airports are better than any airport in the West today. Ports, roads, freeways, metros, not just in the metropolitan cities, but in tier two and tier three cities. I'll give you a very clear example. We had mapped that whenever a metal road gets constructed in a village, HUL sales would go up by 30% within 12 months. It is intuitive. A farmer will be able to cart the produce much more efficiently to the nearest town. Their realizations would go up. And they would invest more money in us. Just think of the kind of infrastructure we are building now. Now let me share with you the India story and then the HUL story, India stack. Layer by layer, we first build the identity layer, then the payments layer, and the data layer. And the next big change that is going to happen in India, the revolution, is going to be the debt revolution. If we look at private debt to GDP, in India it is less than 60%. If you were to look at the developed countries, it would be anywhere between 180% to 250%. The reason was very simple. You can't give a debt if you can't assess a person's credit worthiness. Second is, you need means, ways and means of intercepting the payment for the person who has borrowed money so that you can get the payment on time. Today, digital allows you to do that, which we didn't have ways and means before. Digital identity, just like a GPS tells you where you are, a digital identity tells you who you are. Realize you would not have been able to expand this at the speed at which they have done if manual KYCs had to be done. It would have been virtually impossible. India has opened number of bank accounts for people who were excluded from financial inclusion we have done the job in 10 years, which would normally take four to five decades. That's been the speed. And you know, again, coming back to Winston Churchill's quote, we would have struggled during COVID if we did not have the ability to directly transfer money to the people who needed it most. India has transferred billions of dollars equivalent in direct transfer of benefits. And that's our duty. As a nation, we need to look after our poor. There's no question about that. Otherwise, there'll be complete chaos in the country. That's an obligation we have towards our people. The other remarkable thing has been price of data. India has the lowest cost of data in the world. And thanks to this low cost of data, our data consumption today is one of the highest in the world. 
Of course, you watch movies and IPL, etc. But many people use data for productive resources. You know, I had gone for the January 22nd consecration to Ayodhya. Aap dekhenge, har chote shairo mein, wo weighing machine hoti hai. Ya, aage, pachas paise do, ek rupay do, get yourself weighed. Ayodhya mein, those weighing machines were still there. But payment ke liye, there was a QR code. That's the difference that this is. So many new business models have opened up thanks to the QR codes, the digital payments, and the infrastructure for internet commerce that's been created. This is absolutely revolutionary. I have seen it in my eyes in Bombay, a beggar asking money and flashing his QR code. I'm not exaggerating. It's a reality. But that's the direction in which the country is moving. Now, a classically, an FMCG value chain is a linear value chain. Plan, source, make, deliver, market. Thanks to technology, instead of a linear value chain, we are now having ecosystems. Consumer ecosystems, customer ecosystems, and operations ecosystem with data and technology center stage. So we started a journey of reimagining HUL with an intent to make HUL the most intelligent consumer goods enterprise in the world. That's the vision. So I'll share with you an AV which will give you a perspective of how we are progressing. India is undergoing a rapid transformation underpinned by digitization that is changing the way its citizens work, learn, and connect. Nearly two-thirds of its population uses the internet regularly through the convenience of a mobile device which are becoming increasingly affordable. These have been supported by Digital India, the government's roadmap to a robust digital infrastructure, expansive internet connectivity and increased digital literacy. HUL has been on this journey with its industry-defining transformation program called Reimagine HUL that has purported the mantra of rapid experimentation over the years from an umbrella of experiments to holistic business transformation enabling us to seamlessly connect our consumer, customer and operation ecosystems leading to a superior experience for all our stakeholders. We are transforming from traditional linear value chain to connected ecosystem across consumers, customers, and operations enabled by data, technology, and analytics at its core. This enables the development of modular interconnected capabilities, allowing us to create a frictionless solution for superior experience while improving agility and responsiveness across the business. In the consumer ecosystem, we are bringing together capabilities across trend watching, sizing, testing and production which has allowed us to reduce lead time from months to days. We are doing this by leveraging data, tech and AI to discover and predict future trends to target the biggest opportunities. Our data labs use advanced automation and 3D prototyping to enhance the speed of launching innovations. We have built digital capabilities that span the consumer journey from consideration to purchase. Experimenting early with new age marketing tools like beauty tech and new media vehicles ensures consumers are experiencing our products and services like never before. In the connected customer ecosystem, we are sustaining our distribution advantage through competitive modes across demand generation, capture and fulfillment enabled by digitization and analytics. Our eB2B ordering app Shikhar now reaches over 1.2 million stores. With the ease of anytime convenient ordering and wide assortment, Shikhar has clocked 1.5 billion euros in sales in 2022, making it India's largest eB2B app. We are also wiring up the backend with Project Samadhan. It enables anytime ordering, high assortment, and reliable next day delivery, which is critical to be competitive. Our supply chain is undergoing a transformation across the verticals of plan, source, make and deliver. 
The end-to-end -end integration will be enabled through a nerve center which will combine the four verticals to enable real-time information flow and intelligent decision-making to unlock business value. Our Dapara factory has been recognized externally by the World Economic Forum as India's first digital and sustainability lighthouse. Data, tech and analytics is at the heart of the Reimagine HUL program. The key streams are managing data as an enterprise asset, democratizing access and advanced analytics for decision making. Our cross-functional integrated data lake brings together data across internal, partner and external data sets such as macroeconomic and weather signals. We have developed tools like Chanakya which helps users search any query across billions of rows. Its simple Google-like interface and less than 10 second response time promotes a culture of self-serve and data collaboration. Jarvis, our in-house predictive data science tool, helps us uncover complex relationships between the variables such as price, distribution, media, to help us make cross-lever investment optimization decisions at a de-averaged level and reduce bias from decision making. Making HUL truly future fit. As we digitize our operations and consumer journeys, we are investing in right talent, creating new partnerships, as well as an agile organizational structure to accelerate this journey. Reimagine HUL has delivered end-to-end -end business impact and it's a vital process to stay competitive and future fit in the digital age. The second capability I'm going to talk about is winning in many Indias. You know, before coming to the India job, I used to run North Africa, Middle East, and I had uh, over 20 countries with me. And those 20 countries had more in common than the 29 states of India. They were one predominantly Islamic countries, one language Arabic, one predominant pan-Islamic pan culture, Hamare desh mein, the dialect is different, the language is different, the food habits are different, the way consumers define beauty is different, our competitors are different. So treating India as one India for a large company like in Hindustan Unilever, we were not harnessing the potential. So take a look at what Vinny means. in addition to unlocking growth for the organization has unlocked capabilities for us in supply chain as well. Now we are talking about supply chain capabilities like supply chain for smalls across plan, source, make and deliver space. Wimi has had a profoundly game-changing impact on our tea business. Wimi is so ingrained into our thinking that it is not just core to our strategy. It is our strategy. Everyone in the team thinks with me when it comes to mixes. There is no one-size-fits-all national business because every consumer is different or every market is different when it comes to tea preferences. We've taken Vimi to the heart of how we market to the consumers in India. It has really helped us to not just look at one P via the lens of Vimi, but holistically look at all the six P's when we are really targeting consumers in markets where traditionally we've been weaker on share. I've been privileged to see Vimi at action at HUL for the last decade. Uh, what started off simplistically was just different pricing for wheel in different parts of the country. But it has advanced into something a lot bigger than that now. We're doing jobs to be done at a Vimi cluster level. And we're doing product benchmarking on Surf Excel and a bunch of tea brands versus benchmark competition at a Vimy level. The physical manifestation of Vimy was really the creation and setting up of Central Branch, a tectonic mindset shift to all our stakeholders. 
our customers and employees who saw Unilever as committed to the idea of mining growth from Bimaru. The local administration who now saw Unilever as a homegrown organization with roots in the Hindi heartland. Our consumers who now we intrinsically understood better, who now moved away from just crafting a plan for Uttar Pradesh to one that was significantly crafted and customized for Bhojpur, Avadh, Royal Khand, Braj and Bundel Khand. Now, Vimi, I'll give you a very simple example. If you pick up Brookborn tea, the pack graphics will be same, similar looking, but if you go to different parts of India, the blend inside is different depending on the palates of consumers. Abhi dekhen jaise hum Punjabi, we add tea to milk. But in many other parts of India, you require strong teas. So it's very different blend. Similarly, if you take Surf Excel, same packs, but the formulation inside is different depending on the hardness of the water. So if you pick up a Surf Excel pack, say from Maharashtra, and you bring it to Punjab, you may say, oh, it's washing differently. Yeah, and the reason is because we have customized it for each parts of India. That, in a nutshell, is winning in many India. The other is innovation and product superiority. You know, till the 70s, the world believed that improvement in quality and reduction in cost cannot go together. Then the Japanese, through the automobile industry, proved the world wrong. Through the just-in-time, TPM, TQM, they were able to do both the things. Now the time has come for enhancing quality, reducing cost, and having sustainable products. All three have to go together. A great example we have is one of our RIN washing powder, where better clean, lower cost, and it consumes less water for rinsing. It makes a tremendous difference, because you don't need to consume that much level of water. That's what we need to focus on. We are obsessed with product superiority. And when we talk about product superiority, it is a blind product test, not a branded test. On branded, we will win very easily. But the blind is the asset test. Coming to performance and not me, I think the most important bit is in India, data is treated as a public asset as opposed to the walled gardens of the West. In the West, the big tech companies, they appropriate the data. In India, data is treated as a public asset. The other important bit is whether you look at from a healthcare matrices. Female feticide in India has dropped dramatically. The percentage of girl child has gone up. India as a population, we have been consuming the gross calories but we are significantly deficient when it comes to minerals, vitamins, and micronutrients. That's the journey we are on. The other is sanitation. Sanitation has very clear linkages with health, and of course, the ease of doing business. It's not that we have become an easy place to do business, but the shift is definitely happening. Let's now look at, from a company perspective, what does high performance in Otmi mean? Coming from a consumer goods company, I have to talk about brands. And the troika, again, of great brands is purpose. Purpose beyond the functional attributes. Personalization and performance. These are the three things, and that's how you build the trust of consumers. Trust is not built overnight. Trust comes walking, but it goes on horseback. The moment you do things which will piss off your consumers, you will lose the trust. I'll tell you a Brookbond story. Yeah? Now, Brookbond is, of course, about a great cup of tea. But when Thomas Brook made the brand 100 years back, he said you can bridge differences over a great cup of tea. That's the emotional benefit. So the 
engagement platform that we have been building over the years is Swad Apne Pan Ka. Now take a look at this communication, how what Thomas Brook talked about 100 years back, we are still living to that core proposition. I didn't get a job. Oh, God. I was in a bag. I was in a bag. Where did you go? 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 You forgot the job. Come here. Come here. Come here. No. We're fine. Look at him. He's going to go out. Sunny, I'm making tea. Come here. Take the phone. 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 तुम्हारे घोटनों में दर्द हो गया होगा तो चलो अंदर बैठ के इंतजार करते हैं। अम्मी, चीनी कितने लेंगे? कुछ घरों की चाय में अपने पन का स्वाद होता है। चाय बहुत अच्छी बनी है। Now, what we do under Brook Bond is we pick up what are the tension points in society and we try to bring them to life by saying over a great cup of tea, you can bridge the differences. Now, Surf Excel is all about stain removal. But over the last many years, we've had a proposition called dirt is good. The message that we give is to the mom is, let your kids play, let them get dirty. Without getting dirty, they won't learn and grow. But don't worry, there's Surf Excel to look after the stain. That's the emotional platform. So take a look at what Daag Achhe Hai means. Number one is very big. Number two is big. लगने से अगर कुछ अच्छा होता है तो दाग अच्छे हैं ना सब फिक्सल दाग अच्छे हैं वापस नहीं करना अरे नमाज पढ़ कर आता हूँ। बाद में रंग पड़ेगा। अपने पन के रंग से औरों को रंगने में दाग लग जाए, तो दाग अच्छे हैं। Surf Excel। Guys, अगर communication अच्छी लगे, you have Harpreet's permission to clap. Yeah, but again, you know, look at it. On one hand, we talk about product superiority. On the other hand, we occupy the emotional space in the minds of the consumers. That's how you build a great brand. The other very important bit for us to do business is aligning with the national agenda. You know, despite the mighty Himalayan rivers, despite Punjab being the state for five rivers, we have not managed our water resources. And if we are not able to manage them in the next 10, 15 years, the water supply will be half the demand. Now, you may ask, what do you want to do with Unilever from Hindustan Unilever? When you wake up, you want to clean your teeth. Hopefully, with close-up or Pepsodent, you require water. Then you want to have a great cup of tea. Taj Mahal or Brook Bond or Lipton, you require tea. And if you drink coffee or brew, 
with tea, which you will require water. Then you want to go and wash your hair with tresemme or dove, you require water. You want to take a shower with lux or dove, you require water. You come out, you want to wear squeaky clean clothes, washed by surf or wheel or rain, requires water. Phir aap khane bethe ho, you want clean dishes, washed by whim, you require water. If there's no water, we won't have a business. So take a look what we have been doing when it comes to water. It is predicted that in 10 years from now, India will have half the water it needs. But in many parts of the country, parched earth and conflict over water are already making headlines. Water is a resource we all share as humanity. It is everyone's issue to solve for, not just the governments or farmers. India gets adequate rainfall. We need to manage it well, save enough, and use it carefully. This is at the heart of what we do at HUF. We support women, farmers, NGOs, panchayats, government, and even the private sector to come together so that we can secure water for all. Villages in Bundelkhand are reviving 10th century water tanks through Shramdan and Smart Science. In Andhra Pradesh, farmers use gamification to decide which crops to grow based on data simulations for rainfall and groundwater. Young women in patriarchal East UP work as professional farm advisors, training farmers to change their traditional practices, to use less water and grow more. Punjab's farmers are planting digital sensors in paddy fields to record soil moisture in real time. This helps them switch on and switch off their water pumps as needed. मेरा एक किसान दा दो किल्लियां दे विच इन्ना बिजली ते स्प्रे वगैरा दा फायदा हो सकदा ता होर किसानां नु भी वर्तना चाहिदा ता के पंजाब दे विच जेडी पानी दी काट कारण मशक्कत आ रही है उस ते निजात पाया जा सकते इन आंध्र प्रदेश एंड वेस्ट बंगाल पीपल यंग एंड ओल्ड आर कमिंग टुगेदर टू बिल्ड स्ट्रक्चर्स इन देयर विलेजेस टू सेव वाटर ड्यूरिंग मानसूनस ई वनरल में दा एक को मी मोटेंशियल दे के वनरल में इन तक करूलो गड़ा ई एड समय चले HUF's programs have created a potential of 1.3 trillion liters, a volume that can meet India's entire drinking water needs for a year. We have the science and the solutions to solve for India's water crisis in our lifetime. But this is ultimately a movement by and for the people of India, a movement that HUF is committed to support. You know, we've been working on the demand side and supply side. This 1.3 trillion is about two years dated. It has now crossed 2.6 trillion liters. Now we are using satellite mapping, sensors, etc., to help the farmers. But this is still a drop in the ocean because 80% of the water is used in agriculture. But the important bit is, if we don't focus on water, we are facing an existential crisis. Suvida is something which, uh, just go back please, uh, yeah, just wait. Suvida is something which in uh, first time I met Mr. Modi after he had become the Prime Minister in 2014, he said you guys are doing a lot of work in rural India. We have serious problem in urban slums. Can you help improve their lives? So we made a plan. We went to Bombay Municipal Corporation. It took us two years to convince them to give one old, dilapidated toilet block to make a Suvida Center. Yeah. Last year, BMC came to us and said, we will build 100 more Suvida Centers. Will you give us your expertise and technology? That's the shift. We have now got 20 Suvida centers. Take a look how it gives a life of dignity to a slum dweller. 
क्योंकि रात को पेड़ भर के खाना नहीं खाते लड़की लोग लेडीज लोग तीन बजे चार बजे को अभी बाथरूम आ जाएगा ना बाहर जाने के लिए बहुत डर लगते मोर देन बिलियन ह्यूम लिव इन अर्बन स्लम ग्लोबली दे हैव नो एक्सेस टू सेफ एंड हाइजेनिक टॉयलेट्स resulting in serious health implications in line with the sustainable development goals unilever is bringing access to hygiene and safe sanitation for all but doing the same in slums without any infrastructure was a challenge presenting the suvidha center a unique self sustaining community hygiene center providing safe access to toilets drinking water showers and laundromats This Unilever initiative in partnership with the Municipal Corporation of Mumbai and HSBC has set up 12 such suvidha centers. Each center has been inclusively designed for women, children, elderly and persons with disabilities to ensure no one is left behind. They are open 24/7 and brightly lit for safety. With pricing as low as 1 cent per day, each suvidha center provides safe sanitation to everyone. Moreover, all centers operate sustainably and save over 50 million liters of water every year. The suvidha centers are further reinforced in the community with behavior change programs focused on hygiene and sanitation. More than 300,000 people now have access to safe sanitation. it is self pain on the opic side we break even the first year and consumers are willing to pay just think of it a woman in the house has to get up 3 in the morning go and fill up pails of water if she starts getting water or she has a laundromat where she can go and wash her clothes she can do much more productive use of her time that's how it makes a difference to their lives so operating on esg i'm a big believer of that it does result in value creation it saves you costs it uplifts your productivity and enhances the trust and transparency that the society has yeah we have been ranked number 1 in dow jones sustainability index for all the work that we do the principle of esg that i want to talk about is first business and brand should be a force for good you will not get a societal license to operate if we don't ask yourself what is the purpose behind the brands and the business the second important bit is your business has to be driven by purpose and values esg is not a journey it's not a destination it's a journey you have to focus on innovation in esg in a manner similar to that what you do for your business you have to have a value chain approach a stakeholder approach and create a capabilities in the just to give you an idea you know plastic has become a public enemy number one hul we collect more plastics from the streets of india than we use in the packaging and reprocess them and i'm talking about 120000 tons of plastic yeah but you need to have this entire ecosystem around it and very importantly sustainability is to be built into the targets for managerial remuneration you have to put your money where your mouth is that's when it makes a difference culture extremely important culture is behavior at scale and the right behaviors are those behaviors which people practice when no one is watching them that's what a great cultural organization we pride ourselves if you were to ask me what is that dna of hul i would say classical middle class mindset frugal hard working driving towards excellence every day is better than the previous day that's what we strive for we may be one of the richest corporation in the world but our frugal mindset would never go away 
The author is fetish for execution. You may have a great strategy. And if you can't build a great strategy, the McKinsey's and BCG's can come and do it for you. But no one will do the execution for you. HUL manufactures and sells 65 billion units every year. That's 40 units for every Indian. Every day, 9,000 trucks ply the streets of India carrying a raw material of finished goods. If we don't have execution as a core strength, we will falter. When a consumer goes to a store, doesn't find a Dove shampoo, for instance, they're not going to run around for Dove shampoo. Invariably, they'll buy another shampoo, and you may lose a consumer for life. So you have to ensure the thousands of SKUs, 65 billion units, sold in 9 million stores, are available at arm's reach of desire. That's what great execution is about. The other important bit is leaders. Leaders building leaders. We pride ourselves. There are over 400 CXOs in India and abroad who proudly wear a badge trained by HUL. And that's the reason we call ourselves CO Factory because of the number of leaders we provide to corporate India. And the job of building leaders is not that of HR. It's the job of every leader in the company. It's only leaders who build leaders. Value creation mantra. Again, three axes. Growth, margin, and capital velocity. Just look at these numbers, yeah? We added 33,000 crores as delta turnover in the last 10 years, which is much more than the total turnover of our next biggest competitor. Significantly higher. Our margins went up by 850 bips. And our return on capital employed, tangible assets, is in three digits. So think of the business model where whatever is invested, the same amount comes out as return every year. And if you focus on this three axis, then you end up creating huge value. So what are the learnings to win in India? My last slide. Very importantly, growth mindset, distinctive capabilities which are hard to replicate, and high performance in not me. Troika of building great brands, purpose, personalization, and performance. Consumers are local and not global. Global consumer is a myth. If you want category leadership, straddle the price benefit pyramid. India is not one homogeneous entity. It's a very heterogeneous country. Align yourself with the national agenda because you're part of the society. If the society thrives, the business will thrive. And India is a place where you can maintain the highest standards of ethics and still be successful. When you look at the list of electoral bonds, you will not find Hindustan Unilever anywhere. <laughs> I believe that India will be the biggest consumption story this decade and beyond. Thank you, and let me open up now to questions. Thank you. May I now invite Ms. Harpreet Kang and Mr. Gaurav Mujal to please join, on, join us on the stage. And we'll have the Q&A. Mr. Mehta, please have a seat. Yeah, please. Yeah, go ahead, gentlemen. I know there's a lot of excitement for the questions, but I have something which I want to start off. Ms. Kang, Mr. Munjal, Mr. Mehta, please have a seat. While listening, these four lines are in my mind, and I want to say these four lines, and then we'll open the stage for questions as well. Okay. जिंदगी की असल लड़ाई अभी बाकी है मेरे इरादों का इम्तिहान अभी बाकी है 
अभी तो बांधी है मुट्ठी भर जमीन हमने आगे पूरा आसमान अभी बाकी है दिस इज फॉर यू मिस्टर मेहता लिस्निंग टू योर स्टोरी वेरी वेरी इंस्पायर थैंक यू गुड इवनिंग संजीव जी आई थिंक इट वॉज वेरी इंस्पायरिंग एंड एंड रियली आई एम इंस्पायर्ड बाई योर ऑल ऑफ द प्रजेंटेशन माई क्वेश्चन इज बेसिकली वी आर अ मिड सेगमेंट और एम एस एम ई बी टू बी ब्रांड राइट एंड वी आर लुकिंग अप टू गेटिंग इन टू बी टू सी बिजनेस सो दैट्स वाई आई वॉज हेयर एंड बिकॉज आई नो यू आई हैव ऑलरेडी हर्ड यू इन फ्यू ऑफ द फोरम्स सो वन लाइनर और टू लाइनर इफ यू कैन शेयर अबाउट लाइक यू नो वी गेटिंग इन टू फ्रॉम बी टू बी टू बी टू सी how uh, uh, you look at yeah. uh, the next uh, movement yeah you know when you get into b2c you will often look at your competitors and uh, what i would advise you look at your competitors very closely see what they are doing what they are not doing but your obsession should be not with the competitor but with another c that's consumers if you were to meet their unmet needs if you were to delight them and you have to win their trust and confidence then no one can stop you that's what you need to do ask and get your consumer you know even after being a ceo for 22 years i still used to regularly go to the markets to the retail stores and to consumer homes and to consumer homes we go in cognito to understand ki wo kaise apne kapde dhote hain bartan kaise dhote hain what are their unmet needs are there pain points that we can help them solve so maintain that obsession with consumers and the victory shall be yours thank you thank you for the piece of advice thank you for the question we have another one uh, good evening mr mehta uh, good evening i'm amrit i am rit um, we spoke about uh, you spoke about compassionate uh, capitalism. capitalism yeah um is the first time i heard about it um is it di- different from ethical capitalism and if yes how you know ethical capitalism could imply that you're complying with the laws of the land your integrity is absolutely like uh, caesar's wife beyond suspicion but compassionate capital goes beyond that if you look at a country like india if we do not have transfer of wealth from the rich to the poor we would not do justice to our population you know i'll give you a very simple example if you take consumption the bottom 50% of the consumers have 9% of the consumption that's not an equation which can survive you know many times people say ki yaar hamari country mein personal taxation bahut zyada hai yeah it's still much lower than many of the scandinavian countries which are pure welfare state but if we don't tax the people who earn wealth how will we transfer wealth to the people who need and that's where compassionate capitalism comes in thank you Thank you for that question. Guys, I'm not a socialist, huh? Let me give you a bit of insight. I believe, I believe that in your 20s, if you're not a socialist, then you don't have a heart. But 30s and beyond, if you're not a capitalist, then you don't have a head. <laughs> <laughs> But 40s and beyond become compassionate capitalist. Okay. We have yes. another question coming up. Uh, yeah. Good evening sir. I'm Good Charu. Evening. I'm in Hi, healthcare. Charu. And beautiful presentation by you and Thank you. Thank you for empowering us and fueling us with such good thoughts. Uh I know Vimy has been very close to your heart and you have been pepping up a lot of your 
you know, youngster managers and uh, boosting your startups with it. And I would like to know how do you carry the trust of putting your differentiation of your product, of your taste, as if you mentioned uh, in your tea, country-wise, area-wise, and you know, um, yeah. what do you call, um, if you, because we are facing this tough competition online. Yeah. Like if I want to procure some particular medicine, it's only for Punjab. It's not, and it's only available in Bangalore. So a lot of time we face this hitch that according to the taste, if I want to procure that you medicine, won't get it. I won't get it. I know. So how do you how do you differentiate yeah. your products uh, at yeah. the back end and because and how do you face that tough competition because it's available online? Sure. Yeah. Sure. So a few things. You have many questions laced in one, but let me try to decipher and unpeel yeah. the onion. First is you're absolutely right. Say suppose if you were to sell through Amazon and you were to send through the central warehouse, differentiating would be very difficult, yeah? But 80% of our business is offline. And when it comes to offline, it is much easier, yeah? The second question that you have is to what extent can you differentiate? How much? Up the Luka level mein karoge, ki city level mein karoge, ki cluster level mein karoge, now, you have to bring a balance between focus and scale. Agar aap ekdam chote level mein chale jaoge, the complexity will be so huge that it will overwhelm you. But if it is so broad, then it won't give you the benefit of winning. So we have found out a right fit. We started with 15 clusters. And what we did is, we tried to find out relatively homogeneous cluster. And for some, it is more important than the other. Hmm. Yeah? A red lipstick is a red lipstick. You don't need to segregate it. Yeah? But when it comes to tea, when it comes to laundry, then it will be different. And sometimes what we do, we make certain brands, we sell only in certain parts of India. Okay. Yeah? But I believe that many times in business or in management schools, they tell you that you have to eliminate complexity. I come from a different school of thought. You have to be able to manage complexity rather than eliminate complexity. You know, it's, complexity is a bit like cholesterol. Now, if you are able to manage, then it's like a high-density lipoprotein, the good cholesterol. Yes. So, if you are able to manage complexity, then it becomes a competitive edge. I got your answer. So, if it is tough, but if you can crack it, then the benefits are disproportionate. Yeah? Thank you. All right. Thank you for the question. We have more questions coming up. Dr. Sandeep Kapoor. Thank you, sir, for such an enlightening uh, presentation. Oh, you're uh, welcome. Uh, sir, two questions. Uh, Please. Uh, one is, uh, can you throw some light on the uh, on the rural consumption side? Yeah. Uh, particularly telling the story of uh, Dove, which I understand you are selling more in uh, rural areas than in urban. Mm -hmm. And the second is uh, the D2C story. Okay. Uh, how, how, how and what is your thoughts and okay. uh, vision on that? I thought when you were talking about rural consumers, you were going to talk about the rural consumption slowdown. Ke mein. Right. Yeah? yeah? But that's, let's keep it aside. I have my own hypothesis. But uh, talking about, you know, it's very interesting that uh, many years back when I was chairman of Bangladesh, yeah, nearly 24, 23 years back, and uh, we had started a massive rural drive. My normal intuition was that a large pack size of Lux won't sell in rural India, a rural Bangladesh. But contrary to belief, one of the largest selling SKUs was a large pack. Yeah? And there the intuition, the counterintuitive really not a counterintuitive thing. A logical thing was that you were getting more value out of the money spent. 
But over the years, doctor, what has happened is, thanks to technology, accessibility, even a girl staying in rural India, in Muzaffarpur, for instance, or the villages are near Muzaffarnagar, she aspires for the products which are best in class. Now, Dove is one-fourth moisturizing cream. It's a very unique technology. And people buy the small Dove and they use it only on their face. I haven't come across a man or a woman who doesn't want to look good. Yeah. And people would do whatever is possible to make their skin glow. Blemish free, spot free. And if you can get Dove at an accessible price point, then what Dove kharidenge? Or gharme rakhenge and use it only for their face. Yeah? That's how you break open the barriers. And think of it. I think every man and woman in whatever part of the country they are living in, they have a right to access the good things in life. And as far as possible, we should facilitate that. Yeah? All right. Thank you. Yes, please. Anji. Thank you. What's my hypothesis? Yeah, so how to understand yeah. that, and yet you're saying on this that uh, in rural consumption, yeah. uh, what's going on in our uh, Yeah, all right. Let me give you my hypothesis. Yeah? Uh, the 80% of the land area in India is fragmented. It's one hectare. Most of the people who live, the majority in India, in rural India, they are not landowners. They work on the land. So rural wages or agri-wages is a very important constituent which determines the rural demand. If you look at, over an extended period of time, the rural wages in most of the years have been growing at low single digits. We would have had a major crisis on our hand during the COVID period. It was saved because we had the direct transfer of money and we gave free food grains of 5 kg and another 5 kg at subsidized rate. And that is the reason during the COVID period, you will recall the rural demand was more better than the urban demand. But once the government pulled the plug on the direct transfer, and the five plus five became just five, and together with that came inflation, unprecedented inflation. And that has taken a toll on the spending power of the rural consumer. You know, my belief is, ladies and gentlemen, that we will need agri-reforms. No question about that. Yeah, we will have to go through corporatization or cooperativization because we will have to improve our yields. You know, even our best of the yields do not compare with the best in the world. And then when you compare between, say, Punjab and Maharashtra, it drops down to one-third in Maharashtra. Now, those are things, if we don't tackle head-on, we will not be able to lift 60% of a population which still lives in rural India.
But yes, we'll have to do the reforms by taking the population along and in a compassionate manner. Yeah, but it is inevitable. That's my hypothesis. Yeah? It is fundamentally we will have to alter the shape of how our people earn money in rural India so that we can put more money in the hands. And you know, say cons consumer goods, our consumption will not go up if the wealth of Mr. Mukesh Ambani or Mr. Gautam Adani goes up. No. Our consumption goes up when there is more money in the hands of more people. That's when the consumption goes up. That is when more people will buy the more bikes and the two-wheelers and the bicycles. Hello. Yeah, please. Could we have the mic, please? Thank you, sir. from your discussion. Uh, this is about the Hindustan Unilever as the factory of CEOs. Anji. So what, if you can share some of the practices, I mean, we have this crisis of leadership uh, in our SMEs particularly. Yeah. If you can share some of these practices which uh, Hindustan Unilever follows. Yeah. I, mean, I heard about the listers uh, and others, if you can throw some ideas where we can develop the talent in our organizations. That would be great. Certainly, certainly. You know, first, very important is having a very strong employer brand. Yeah? And the employer brand gets strengthened when you not only have good HR practices, but very importantly, as a business, you are winning. So a good employer brand enables us to be the employer of choice when we go to the campus. So we don't go across all the campuses in the country, we only go across certain top campuses. And within those comp campuses, we recruit the best. So first is, get the best possible talent. Yeah, But our philosophy is you get the best and make them better. So we have, starting with, we have a very rigorous management training program where we make them go through different functions. They still spend time in rural India, live in rural India. You can never understand rural marketing or rural distribution unless you spend time in rural India. They go to factories. They go to different businesses. So we invest a lot. And while they are in the management training, we have coaches and mentors at that stage itself who help them. Then we have a very rigorous process of evaluating people. And we constantly evaluate people. It's not once in a year kind of process. And we work out what the development needs are, how do we help them plug that gap, we also help each individual identify their purpose in life. And we help them live their purpose. And then in a very structured way, we help develop their skills and capabilities. And put them to test at every stage. And those who keep getting filtered, keep growing up. And it's a very competitive space. So many people who join in, they do not last long because they find it difficult to survive. And then we send them abroad. We send them to different markets in different functions. And that's how we nurture. But very importantly, you know, I'll tell you there is, all our offices have got crash facilities. Our Bombay head office crash it also has a kindergarten which has been rated as the best KG school in Bombay. The reason is very simple. That we want men and women to have that peace of mind where they can excel 
and when you are a new parent, you want to have your child close by. We give paternity leave, maternity leave, much beyond the scale. We also have very clear policies uh, to help you with your parents and in-laws if they need help. Yeah, then domestic violence, we take upon the owners to help you. Were that to be the case? So very progressive policies we have. I'll give you one example. Uh, the women in management in HUL is now 46%. In another couple of years, we'll have gender balance. Now we are putting our attention on women in the factory shop floor and in the sales field force. So we have started very clear programs where we would like to increase the number of women over there. We have a factory in Haridwar where from the factory manager to the shop floor level, everyone is a woman. We just wanted to make that point that women can do it. You know, when I came in, the normal thinking in our society is women leave at the point at which they get married or when they have baby. So we were losing a lot of women and this was the normal explanation given to me. So I asked my team members, go back and check those who had left us, are they sitting at home or working? And 80% of them had started working. So I reached out to them. I said, why didn't you come back to HUL? They said, after a maternity leave, when we come back, the people give us soft jobs. Now she's a mother, young mother, she'll have to devote more time. We don't want soft jobs. Because if we get soft jobs, we will lose the race. Give us normal jobs. Then we had a very clear project in my mind, which I drove. We will lose no mothers. So I would follow up when they were on leave and ensure that when they come back, they have challenging jobs. You know, we need to understand the special circumstances of women, but we don't need to give them favors. They don't need favors. And that's where you break stereotypes and create an environment where people can excel. The other is accountability. You know, when we did win winning in many Indias, we also set up what we call as the country category business teams. We set up 15 mini boards. Each board had a general manager and members of every function. That resulted in huge amount of empowerment. But we must understand that there is a very thin line between delegation and abdication. Delegate, but not abdicate. But you need to empower people, hold them accountable. That's how they will grow. And that's how you will unleash the energy in the organization. So many people ask me, tell me one thing which makes HUL succeed. I tell them it's never one thing. It's all about and. So I would say there is not one thing which makes HUL a CEO factory, but series of things. At the end of the day, it comes with the basic premise that great businesses are made by great people. You know, when, sir, I was running North Africa, Middle East, we had Arab Spring. And the whole countries were up in flame. We had a big business in Egypt. And that was the time in Egypt when even the police had left the barracks. There was no one over there. So we had our own people stay in the factories to protect the factories from arsonists. What we had done, we sent our teams to the wholesalers and collected, and our distributors collected as much cash they had. They were very happy to give it to us because they were worried, otherwise it would get stolen. Then we took the money and went to wholesalers and said, whatever food grains you have, we'll collect it from you. 
They were happy to let go the stock. We brought it to the factory. Anyone in our ecosystem, direct or indirect, needed food, they'd come to the factory and collect it free of cost. We made packets of notes and sent it to the houses of people because even ATMs were closed. Very simple philosophy, sir, I ingrained that time, which I've been practicing since then. Look after your people, and the people will look after your business. Thank you for that answer. And in the interest of time, we'll take a last question. Um, Mr. Hello. Sanjeev Mehta still joins us for dinner, so we'll Hello. continue Hello. management 101 there. Hello. Yes. Uh, hi, Mr. Mehta. Uh, hi. I'm Dr. Deepak Jain. Hi, doctor. So, uh, we have, you know, you have shared many success stories of HUL products. Failures, tell me. The whole night will be gone. So, uh, just coming to the same question. Mm -hmm. So, uh, any share, you, you can share the failure story with what went wrong and what was the learning. Okay. Now, let and me... And my uh, okay, second, second question is, yeah. how do you see the future of, uh, you know, HUL without leadership of Mr. Sanjeev Mehta? Okay. You know, uh, quarter three profits are down. After you, you got retired, share prices are down by 15%. Okay. So how do you see the future? Okay. Now, <laughs> let me first answer the easier question, the first question. Yeah. You know, doctor, in FMCG, seven out of ten innovations don't work. And out of the three that work, 70% of them don't work the first time. So you have to be ready for failures. I can count so many instances where we have believed in the product, but it has bombed in the marketplace. But some of the big failures that I would say is, one of the big things a leader has is ensuring that right people are on the bus and they occupy the right seat. I was in HUL during my days as a CEO chairman, and one very important seat I had to fill. And uh, we shortlisted two, three people. And I believed in one person that he would fit the bill. But that time my boss prevailed over me and said, another person who said has worked with him would be a better fit. Now, I could have vetoed him. I could have politely said, thank you, boss. I'll go with my recommendation, but I gave in. And I regret today why I gave in, because after a year and a half, I had to again change that person. But I lost that one and a half year. Yeah? That's serious, you know, acquisition. I remember as a young, when I was in m and uh, we were making a pitch. And I went very conservative. You know, you have to determine what is the enterprise value. And enterprise value is based on present value of future cash flows. And that depends on the future growth rate. I took a very conservative view and lost out. It still haunts me. That was my first MND. Yeah. But over the years, what I believe, that failure is not the opposite of success. So long as you don't keep repeating the failure, same failure. If you want to fail, fail doing something else. But if you do business, business entails risk and risk entails failure. If you don't fail means you're not stretching yourself. Doctor, I'm not worried about failures. So long as I learn from the failures, and so long as I have more successes than failures, and I try very hard not to repeat the failure. Yeah? That's my philosophy on failure. Thank yeah. you. And we the, close on, with that. On the, on the second question, let me give it a pass. Let's have dinner together. <laughs> yeah. Hello, Mr. Mehta. Thank you for that yeah. question. Thank you for those answers as well. Hello. May I uh, may I now request 
Mr. Samir Nair, CMD Freemans, to kindly give away a token of gratitude to our speaker of the day. Oh, thank you. That's so kind of you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. You all were amazing audience. Thank you, Mr. Sameer, for joining us on the stage. May I request Ms. Harpreet Kang for her presidential remarks? Good evening. It's overwhelming to speak after Sanjeev, right? Um, president or not, whatever. For me, it's a flood of thoughts today, honestly. Um, all my life, I've been hearing these little anecdotes and stories about how Unilever does it. One interesting fact that I would love to hear over dinner, and I'm sure many would know here, is that long before we liberalized in 1990, we already had Unilever here, not to mention Bata and a couple of other European brands. So how did that happen when everybody else was kept outside? Maybe he knows how. But uh, if you look at the way the model goes, I think we have so many lovely takeaways today. Because um, as you look at this, 1888, Unilever comes to India and brands a soap for the first time in our country. 1960s, I remember uh, our business uh, director back at PCT would talk about it, that he would be as a pass out, or not even a pass out, as an intern from I Am Him The Bard, when you go to work with NGOs, they would take this van and go into rural India for six months internship. And uh, fascinating stories because you would switch on a screen at the back of the van put on what was called a chitrahar or some song so that people would actually come together in the village. And then you would show them magic with surf because they would take off this vest from a laborer and put it into the bucket and then voila, it would all go absolutely sparkling white. And that was magic. People would literally clap for it. Uh, so how innovatively Unilever has understood our culture, not even being an Indian company, not to mention the name Hindustan itself used. Uh, it's, it's got different names in different countries, including Netherlands, where it's called Ola. But it's only in India where the word Hindustan is used when it's not Hindustani at all. But all very amazing branding work and exercises and takeaways. Uh, one of my friends who then went into market research, graduated from MICA, talked about how she would have people come in to her market research qualitative center and actually do real-time shampoos on different kinds of hairs so that Dove could understand how it has worked. But then, so much beautiful communication, and there's also a lot of miscommunication. Again, another story I hope to hear over dinner when we also have Fair and Lovely, which tells you, if you're not good, you But Dove also talks about women empowerment, so that also is there. So I have mixed feelings and so many, uh, you know, brushes with the brand, and we all have experiences from the time we are born. We've literally lived every single day with Unilever. And I think it's phenomenal to have Sanjeev here because we all run our big and small businesses as compared to Ludhiana City. Some of us run them in a few cities. But when you try to wrap your head around this one, the very, the very magnanimous, you know, uh, magnitude of it is so humongous, it's so uh, mind-boggling to understand how do you even uh, get by it. And then to do what Sanjeev has done, to, to give it that phenomenal rise, to take it from where it went in the past decade. Uh, we, I'm, I'm in awe, and that's why I've been pestering him to come here. I'm very happy to have you here, Sanjeev. Thank you so much. I'm sure so is everyone else here. Um, lovely to have you as audience. Let's continue this over. I leave it for 
Gaurav and Raghav to wrap it up. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. Kong, for your remarks. May I now Thank invite you. Mr. Gaurav Munjal, Senior Vice President and Managing Director for Hero Ecotech for his formal word of thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mehta, for a lovely evening. And there's so much of learning, which I did not know were owned by Unilever. It's amazing to see the scale of operations of uh, Unilever. And doing the basics, which is the roti kapda makan, is what they are focusing on. And then they've built on that. What we take for granted, you know, we take, okay, infrastructure should happen, we expect it. But somewhere we forget that what is our role in India, that if India grows, we grow with it. And I've always seen a lot of multinationals coming into India and growing the way they grow, you know, which we as a country overlook, we as Indians overlook. If you look at the hotel chains that come from outside India or Unilever, now I think Unilever is more of Indian than a foreign company. But it's amazing what goes on behind the scenes, their research, their ground, the work at the ground level, and what they do under maybe CSR or what they do for the people. And I think as a country and as people of Ludhiana and the nation, I think it's our responsibility to make things happen. There is a lot of opportunity and there is a lot of challenges. And it's amazing how they've grown the brands that they've done. So thank you. And uh, let's hope we see you again sometime. And I have one question for you. Please. Yeah. How, do you, how do you create cultures? I mean, you know, there is, you, you've acquired some brands. HUL has acquired brands. How do you make things happen, you know, at different levels? Yeah. That's an absolutely fabulous question. You know, when we acquired GSK, uh, integrating the business, that's distribution, manufacturing, <coughs> all those were relatively easier. The most difficult part when you do an M&A is integrating the culture. Though the good bit was that GSK also has its Anglo origins, so in many ways a bit similar, but it's not the same culture. Yeah, HUL is a very performance-driven company. So we had to first do a lot of tests to identify people, what their gaps are vis-a-vis -vis our culture, and then take proactive steps to inculcate and imbibe those culture in them. Now, in the process, you lose some talent because many people would not be comfortable with the kind of culture we have. But so be it. You know, I'm on the board of Air India. One of the biggest challenges we are facing today is, again, cultural transformation. Of course, new planes to hum lenge. Yeah, new simulators for training to hogi. We are getting them. Yeah, new IT, new apps. All that is coming. But the big transformation will be from people who have grown up in public sector to make them consumer focused to make them accountable for performance. That's again cultural transformation. So you're so right, that remains, whenever there is an m and one of the biggest challenges. And I think uh, everybody is waiting today for your talk. And the gathering, I think, is full house. So, and I think he deserves a big applause. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you everyone for sharing, uh, uh, having such a big uh, celebrity. I think we, for, my, for me personally, I think people who achieve success in business, I don't believe in the actors and actresses. I believe in people who made a difference to people, who country, uh, companies which have made the difference are the true celebrities. So thank you and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gaurav. And uh, well, while we have a huge round of applause for Mr. Mehta here, you, there are seven people, seven of us are 
guys who you'll see around wearing uh, ID cards of Team LMA who've been putting this show together since running around since 11 in the morning. So if you see them, give them a pat on the back as well. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming in. Um, you know, please join us for fellowship and dinner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.